Lord. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Uh, I'm grateful to be here. I'm thankful, and I'm actually, I feel like I'm, I'm uh, oh, it's one of those days that, that I'm trying to get everything together, but it's not, it's not uh, coming together the way it should. <laughs> but um, um, I ask that you bear with me today, that you um, just uh, be patient with me a little bit today as well, because we got, we finally got our our new computer, and hopefully the the quality is a little bit better. Uh, maybe there won't be as much buffering and those kind of things. Uh, it'll actually come out seamlessly. The other thing is, what's going to be really nice is, is we're going to be able to record them, so when they go on YouTube, they'll also be a lot better quality. Um, so th with the other computer that we had, it was just w it just wasn't going to happen. There's no way we could stream and record at the same time. That was it was just going to be way over the heads of of the computer that we had. So um, I ask that, like like I said, I ask that you bear with me because at the same time I thought I had everything and I don't. So I'm missing a couple of pieces and um, just some simple cables, uh, you know, some monitor cables basically, and and so it's not we're not able to do a little bit of the things that we typically usually do and having to set up the whole thing all over again as well um, so that it, everything looks nice and everything like that it's i noticed there was a couple of little a little uh <coughs> some glitches as, as i was watching the introduction and things like that but we'll we'll get those sorted out by next next shabbat for sure uh, but again welcome everybody welcome everybody uh, online those of you watch later um but so today, uh, because of, like I said, because of the technical difficulty that we're going to be having, that we have, we're going to go straight into the Word, which is, for me, is actually even even better, because I'm so excited to bring this to you. And this is going to be, uh, well, you know what, let me, let me save that for later. Uh, before we do anything else, let's pray, and let's ask the Almighty just to be with us, amen. bow your heads, lift your hands, just praise the Almighty. Father, we come before you on this Shabbat. We've, we've, we've decided, Father, that today is the day that you have made and, and we will be rejoiced and we will be glad in it, that we will praise you, Father. So when we got up this morning, Father, we made a choice. When the sun went down last night, Father, we made a choice. To set this day apart for you, Father, for your work, for your, your anointing, for your glory to be in our midst, Father. And for us to just be obedient to your word. So we thank you and we glorify you. We worship you with everything we have. I ask, Father, that you just be with the people that are, that are watching and that you be with, with, the, with us here in-house, Father. Father, bless and protect and heal your people. Father, I declare wholeness and, and joy and peace in people's lives, Father. I, I declare, Father, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. So, Father, I thank you and I ask, Father, that you help, your, help me, Father, bring forth your word the way you've given it to me. And that any issues, Father, be taken care of, that everything works seamlessly, and that your word can go forth, Father, without hindrance, without without interruption. Father, we bind the works of the enemy. We bind the distractions. We, we declare, Father, that we want to hear your voice, not my voice, but your voice. And we just praise you for that. And we glorify you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. So, um, okay, here we go. Let's get this one. So before we get into the word, let's recite the Shema. Amen. And, and we'll... Yeah. 
Shema Yisrael Jehovah Eloheinu Jehovah Echad Hero Israel, Yehovah is our God, Yehovah is one. Amen and amen. So let me have your seats for, for just a moment. So, uh, as I encourage you always to to check out our check out the website wordofpeacefellowship.com. Uh, if you're on Facebook, share. Especially now, I believe we're going to get into a teaching called "Thou Shalt Love," and um, yeah. Let me say just one more before just before I leave. So we're going to be dealing with the with the teaching called "Thou Shalt Love," and what's really, for me, what's what's really powerful about what we're going to begin today is this is not going to just be a a once in a how would I put it? It's not going to be just like how how we go to we we typically would go and we sit down in the pew and we sit down and. And we listen to the preacher, and, and they would talk, and they would have their, they would give the sermon, and it would be, a, you know, even if, if it was a great sermon, whatever it may be, and then you go and, and you go to, you go home, and then the next week, the next sermon has nothing to do with the one before it. But the apostles and the disciples understood that we need to build on our faith that we need to build precept upon precept we need to to understand the scripture and we need to to as we as we learn like for instance with the with the sabbath day well i'll, I'll put it like in, in with me it was i learned about the zitzit first well i learned about the zitzit and then the zitzit because the whole point of the zitzit the tassel in numbers 15 was to to keep the command. And so from there I learned about the Sabbath day. And then we learned the feast days. And they built upon each other. And so we kept building and building and building. And so that's what what this is gonna be about. This is the the beginning of of a a set of teachings that I, I've been wanting to do for one for for a while and um have been kind of putting together and father has been showing me how to lay these things out and I, i'm i'm so grateful because i know it's him because I, I i'll be reading something and he points out another thing here and he points out another thing there and that's one thing that you know like with with my wife i used to tell her all the time i want to hear the almighty audibly and I had him in a box that he could only speak to me that way. He, and I would never hear him any other way. But, and see, and this is one of those building precepts upon precepts for myself, is I had that concept for so long that he had to only speak to me audibly. He couldn't speak to me in any other place. And learning some things within the book of Acts, I noticed Some reason or another, we'll try. It. How about trying something on that one? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do here. Um, pretty much picking up my volume as high as it will go. So, 
Amen. I, I hope that's a, a little bit better. Uh, oh, let me see. Let's see this this little thing. I I love the OBS Studio. Uh, for any of those any anybody who's doing uh broadcasting or getting ready to do broadcasting, um, OBS Studio is awesome. Because you don't have to go into a whole bunch of other programs to do things. You can do it from right here. You can adjust your volume from the program itself. Uh, so I hope that, you know, something like this would help somebody else as well. Let's see. And I believe this thing has a limit of how high it can go. Unfortunately, because I don't have a keyboard, so I can't type anything. So <laughs> try that. How does how does that sound better, better or worse? Let me know. Um, but like I was telling you about the 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 idea of, of Father can only speak to me in one certain way. I learned, and I've I've read it over and over in Hebrews chapter one. It begins with the idea that that Father spoke in times past. But it just and I've read that. I mean, I probably read that dozens of times because you know during the feast days especially with Yom Kippur uh, with the Day of Atonement with with um, I mean Passover even for months I've, I've read he the book of Hebrews I mean dozens of times already and I, I love that book I, I love the letter to the Hebrews and I've read that verse 1 or chapter one, verses one, one through like five, one through ten, and it says that Yamava spoke in times past, and he names a few. But I never paid attention, <laughs> and when I finally looked at, okay, well, this is how Father speaks, when how he he's done it prior. Yes, with Adam and and Eve, he spoke audibly straight to them they had a conversation with Cain that he spoke with Cain audibly but then he gave Joseph a dream and a vision he, he he's I mean he, he's put words into people's mouths he's he's given people ideas he's um, he's he's spoken in so many different ways that we can see in Scripture so I finally put, I told Yehovah, okay, speak to me however you want me, to, how, however you want to speak to me, show me. And one way that I've seen that he's been speaking to me for a long time <laughs> is that when I'd be reading, I'd be reading, this, reading the word, and then all of a sudden another verse comes into my mind. While I'm reading this one, and I'm like, "Oh, hey, I remember that one. That that ties into this." And so I'll go read it, and sure enough, it I mean, context and everything, it just it just flows together. And so that was one way that Father has been speaking to me. And so do with that, in that process, like I said, in the past few 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 weeks or few months, actually, is I've been trying to listen. <laughs> And these next few teachings that are going to be coming out for the next probably the next few months will is a culmination of that what Yonva has been showing me, and to but it's to build upon what we know. So some of the things that that we've learned are about the feast days. You know, we we just went through the feast days. And we learn the beauty of the feast days and some of the traditions and all those kind of things. Well, there's a little more than just feast days. There's just there's a little more to, to Yehovah than than coming to a Sabbath service, than coming to a a even a, a church service, uh, uh, a synagogue service, you know, congregational service, or a worship service, however you know it's been called. There's more than just coming to that once or maybe twice a week service. There's more than that. And so this is how we're, we're going to deal with. And we're going to begin with thou shalt love. So 
I do want to mention, uh, as always, that at the end of the teaching, you will be given an opportunity to um, to ask questions, to get uh, get any comments, uh, prayer requests, give a testimony, uh, whatever it is uh, that you need to, even a a prophecy. <laughs> and you know, I expect Yahweh to to open up the the words of prophecy and the words of wisdom. You know, in this place, in in our congregation, in a sense. <coughs> Because he said we would do it. So I'm expecting it. You know, I, not all ministry should come from me. I shouldn't be the only one ministering. You know, this is the way I minister, but that's not the only way to do it. So uh, that's one thing I do. Like I said, I, I, I want to give you an opportunity for those things. At the end of this teaching, we'll be able to do that. Uh, and then at the end of the teaching, be able to to support, give your tithes and offerings, uh, gifts, donations, whatever, however you want to. Some people see them as only as gifts and donations. They're not tithes and offerings. They're just a donation. You know, or however you do it, their commands are there, and we're going to deal with some of that stuff. We're going to deal with with the commands over the next few months. And don't get me wrong, we're not going to start with, uh, with uh, <laughs> today is, is not about how you should love money and, and come and, and give everything that you have and because God's going to bless you a hundredfold if you give here. No, it's, it's, this isn't about that whatsoever. Um, like I said, this is, I believe, is going to be a huge blessing for all of us. And it's been a huge blessing for myself. So let's get right into this. Whoa. Okay. This thing moves a little too quickly here. So this is where we're going to begin. This is, I mean, this is one of those verses in Scripture that, in the in the Bible, that most people go to, especially especially anybody who rejects the law, who rejects the, the commands of the Almighty, this is one of those go-to scriptures. This is one of those go-to verses. Because, well, let's read it. Matthew twenty-two thirty-five. 35. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Then Yeshua said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it, a like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So one could argue that all we have to do is love God and love our neighbor. And that's it. We don't have to worry about the law. And we don't have to worry about the prophets. If we only love God. And love our neighbor. Right? Thou shalt love the Lord your God. Thou shalt love thy neighbor. You can make that argument. The problem is. We have to understand. How do we love? Thou shalt, it's a, com he's commanding, right? I mean, this is, if, if, if somebody wants to say, you know, okay, we don't have to keep the laws of God because he's the God of law and he was the God of the Old Testament. He's the God of the Jews. You know, that, that Old Testament God of, was a hateful God and he was a, he was a, a law giving God, but the God of the New Testament, you know, Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, he was the, he's the, the grace he came, he came and he gave grace. So then people want to say, okay, well, we need to keep the commandments that the Messiah gave. Keep his commandments. So they asked him, what is the greatest command? And he said, thou shalt love. He begins with, thou shalt love. So he's commanding. 
he's quoting and he's commanding. It's interesting because what he's quoting is straight from the law, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> uh, but this is one of those commands that says, okay, this is what we have to do. If we're just going to look at his word and only follow the words in red, and I should have left this as, as the red letter edition uh, because it's, it's, uh, these are his words. These are, these are the Messiah's, Yeshua's words right here. So this is a command. He's saying, thou shalt love. How do we love? What does it mean to love? How do we keep his commands, his word, the Messiah's word saying, you shall love the Lord, your God, and you shall love your neighbor. Or when we love somebody, we want to please them and make sure we're pleasing to them. I mean, that's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, as, as a husband, I know that, that, uh, if my wife isn't pleased with me, then, then she's probably not a whole lot in love with me at that moment. <laughs> or if I don't do things to please her, then she's not going to, continually be in love with me you know <laughs> i'm just giving you an example so but this is when you love somebody if, if you if you love your mom if you love your aunt if you love your 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 brother or your sister you're going to do things to please them you're going to do things that that they like or that that you know that they enjoy. You don't want them to to hate you. I mean, because that's really the opposite of love is hate, right? If you don't love somebody, typically you don't hate you hate them. I mean, there's not a whole lot of in between. There's a sometimes you you know you call that like, well, okay, I like them, I like that person, but really you're saying is, well, I just I don't love them. So I just hate them to a small degree. <laughs> That's all that is. There's no, there's no in between. It's either you love them or you hate them. And I mean, uh, like I said, we we sugarcoat some things some, sometimes, but that's the bottom line. There's there's a a a clear cut line that says, okay, I either love them or I hate them. I dislike them to the e even if it's very small. I just I hate them to a very small degree, but I, I, I hate them. <laughs> or I love them. Even if I just barely love them, I love them. <laughs> so when you do something for that person that you love, it shows that you love them. Because just telling somebody, oh, I love you. You know, if I if I told my son, you know, I love you, Mio. And that's all I did, and I just I walked away, and and I never helped him do stuff. I never showed him things. I never explained when he asks a question, or I don't I don't you know play with him. He likes to be you know play cars or Legos or whatever. If I don't do those things that he likes, then when I say I love you. That's all it is, is words, and it doesn't mean anything. Exactly. Actions speak louder than words. I love you. So, like I said, you have to bear with me a little bit. So in John chapter 8, it says, They said unto him, Who art thou? And Yeshua said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. And they understood not that he spoke of them, spoke to them 
of the Father. No. So then Yeshua said unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father has taught me, I speak these things, and He that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. As He spake these words, many believed on Him. So in John chapter 8, even Yeshua, because remember, he, he said in Matthew 22, he said the greatest command is to love Yahweh. We're going to begin with that. You shall love the Lord your God. We, you shall love Yahweh your God. And he says that God, Yahweh, sent him. And that he's true, and he says he's never left me alone. Why hasn't he left him alone? Because he's done the things that please him. He hasn't just done his own thing, but he's done the things that please the Father. You have to bear with me a little bit. <laughs> so Messiah did what pleased the Father. Simply because love is a verb. You don't ever hear somebody saying that love is a noun. If you look in the dictionary, and I should have put this up here, but in the dictionary, even love is an action word. It's, it's just like run or jump. It's an action word. That's what a verb is. So love is an action word. It's not a noun. It's not a, a person. It's not a thing. Even though we know that Yehovah is, God is love. First John tells us that, that God is love. So if he is love, then he is an action. So this is that puts it even more into perspective just a little bit, because when you see that our Messiah, who we're supposed to imitate, he didn't do his own thing. He didn't say, "I ah, forget you," you know, the commands of 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 the of, of my father. He didn't uh, uh, just say, "Oh, you know what? We don't have to keep those those ooh laws anymore. We don't have to to keep the the Sabbath. We don't have to to do the the feast days. We don't have to do any of those things anymore. That's only for the Jews." He didn't do his own thing. He didn't establish his own doctrine. He did what pleased the Father. And that's why I put up here in verse John 3, 8, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. This is why you, you know, people get that that adage where um, don't, um, that actions speak louder than words. Because here even tells us that let us not love in word. Let's not love in just what we say. Or just in how we speak, but in deed and in truth, in actions, in works, and in truth. So there is false love. If there's true love, there's false love. Just like there's there's good works, there's bad works. There's just talking the talk, but and then there's talking the talk and walking the walk. As as uh, James beautifully puts it, he says, "I show you my faith by my works." <laughs> he says, "You may have faith, and you may say you have faith, and that's great. You believe that's good for you. You know the demons tremble. Th you know, yay, they believe too. Good job. You know, you're just as as equal to a demon. Congratulations." He says, "But me, that I actually follow Yeshua, I follow the Messiah. I show you my faith in action." In what I do. So we need to love in deed and in truth. 
in true love and in true deeds. And Yeshua did that. Yeshua pleased the Father, and the Father never left him. And we know his Father gave the Holy Spirit. And Yeshua says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Right? We'll read that, and we, we, we see that in the Gospel accounts. And he says, just wait. Even in Acts chapter 1, he says, wait in Jerusalem for the gift of the Holy Spirit that the Father will bring down. And we know that the Father was also Isaiah's father and Ezekiel's father, who even told us that, hey, we're going to, you know, Ezekiel especially tells us that we're going to be given a new spirit from the Father, from Yehovah. Not just from a father, not just from, you know, father time or something, but from Yehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Hebrews chapter 13, we're going to jump around a little bit. I hope you don't mind. Bring me closer. Now the God of peace that brought again from the from the dead our Lord Yeshua, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting, everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work. Make you perfect in all we do. To do whose will? His will. Not my will, not the denomination, not the religious leader's will, not not the, you know, even your parents' will, but his will. That's why it's so awesome when Yeshua quotes in Matthew 22, when he quotes that you should love the Lord your God. In the context of that verse that he quotes in Deuteronomy says that you we need to teach our children his ways his word when we get up when we go to bed when we're walking down the road when we're when we're sitting and playing when we're when we're all when we're doing everything we're doing we need to teach them his word teach them about him so that they know his will because the end of man the whole duty of man is to keep his commands. It's That's the whole duty of man. We need to know who he is. So the God of peace, and we know who raised up Yeshua from the dead, was Yehovah. Yehovah raised Yeshua from the dead, and he was the first fruit. And because he raised, he says, now that the everlasting covenant has begun, now every good work is for you, for you to do his will. And it's working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Yeshua Messiah. So if you have any questions that this is, we well, have to be well-pleasing in, Yeshua, in Yeshua's sight, he says, no. Through Yeshua, we're well-pleasing to the Father. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. But we're working. We're being worked out. We're being shaped and we're being molded. So that we're well-pleasing. It's interesting, though, in verse 21, we see that it says, Make you perfect in every good work. Well, what work? You know, because remember, we, Yeshua did some work. He did some things. And he was well-pleasing to the Father. Father never left him. And he commanded that you, we should love Yahweh, the Lord, our God, with all of our heart and soul, soul and strength, and that we should love our neighbors ourselves. So what work? And how do we know that it's good work? 
because it says make you perfect in every good work. How do you know if it's good work? Because if you look at, it, at any any denomination, works can be different. Works can vary. Some require that you go on mission trips, and that's good work. Some require that you just show up and sit down and listen. Yes, there's, there's some that will say, okay, your work is y if you go and help feed the poor. You help feed the needy. You work in this or you work in that. You do some extra, uh, you know, stuff in the community. That's good work. Good work is not smoking or not drinking or not, you know, fornicating or having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. That's good work. And then the other ones will say, no, that's y you can do all that stuff. Now you can go to certain denominations and everything is fine as long as you just go and you sing and you clap and you praise and you say amen during the preaching. And that's good work. But according to the scripture and according to the Bible, what is good work? Because like if I was to tell my son, I tell my well, I tell my boys, go clean your room. How do they know that when they're done, they've done a good job? Because I've told them, right? I've explained to them, when you clean your room, you fix your bed, you put away your toys, your shoes get put where they belong, you know, hats and clothes go or wherever they go to in the hamper hang hung up and you know your stuff's not all over the floor uh you know so there's clean your room once they hear clean your room they know okay this is what i've got to do because daddy told them what they had to do <laughs> so wouldn't it i mean doesn't it make sense to say hey you know, Father, what good work, what's good works? In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are, you are light in the, in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Proving what is acceptable. So we have to prove what is the good work. right? What's acceptable? What does is, what is Father say is pleasing to him? What makes him happy? What makes him rejoice? What makes him say that you're the you're a man after my own heart? You're a woman after my own heart. You're a, you're a What what makes you be like Job? Where father says you should, you should try my servant Job cuz he loves me. Try him. Where how do we know it? Well, we have to prove, for one, we have to prove what is acceptable. Because if you can't prove it, and you can't prove it from His Word, then it's probably not what He wants. It's just like, I'll give you an example is it with, with my children. <coughs> I told. I tell my son one thing, and then my other son goes over there and tells him, no, you don't have to do that. It's okay. And so they don't, you know, they don't, they don't put that away or they don't do that, whatever it may be. And so when I get there and it's not done, I'm like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> and he's like, oh, well, you know, 
Louis said I didn't have to do this. Or Josiah said I didn't have to do this. <laughs> and it was like, well, wait a minute, but what did I say? So we have to prove what is acceptable. Because if it's not acceptable, then it's unacceptable. And it's something that he's not going to accept. He's not going to receive. So if you you give a, a sacrifice of praise, but you're doing works that are unacceptable, then he's not going to receive, he's not going to accept your sacrifice. We need to make sure that they're acceptable. And one of the things that we know and we we were told all the time, I mean, anybody who's ever been in a congregation, in a church, and even around believers is, is the idea that Father knows us and, and He's the one whose opinion o- should only matter to us, especially His opinion. is the only opinion that, that matters. Right? We, we shouldn't have to worry about everybody else's opinion about us but worry about His, because one day we're going to stand in front of the Most High and He's going to judge us according to what we say and what we've done. Right? We're going to have to give an account, every single one of us. Now, teachers, preachers, evangelists, pastors, apostles, all of them are going to have to give an account even more But every single believer is going to have to give an account. And every single, not just believer, but every single person, creation, is going to have to give an account to the Almighty. So when we stand before Him, His opinion matters. His opinion counts for everything. Right? So if Paul tells the Ephesians, you know what, we need to prove what is good and acceptable, then it would behoove us to prove what is good and acceptable. And then Paul writes again, he says, we're going going a little forward. I haven't even touched the Old Testament yet. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes to to the Thessalonians, and he says, for our exhortation was not of deceit. Now, he's, he's talking about himself. He's dealing with the, what he taught and what he, he, he brought to them. He says, our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, nor of uncleanness. But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but Elohim, God, Yehovah, which trieth our hearts. Remember in Jeremiah tells us that he's the one, because our hearts are deceitfully wicked, that he's the one that actually tries the heart, that he's the one that's going to, to, really dig deep and he's going to see what's inside of us. We may look perfect and beautiful on the outside, but inside, as Yeshua said, you're just like dead man's bones, ugly and full of uncleanness. It's possible. So the Almighty searches the heart. In Jer- Like I said, Jeremiah 17 talks about that. And here Paul is just bringing that out again. He says, we speak not not as men pleasers, but we're speaking that we make sure that we please the Almighty. That we're doing His will. Remember, because that's the whole point. Is to do good works so that we do His will. For neither at any time We flattered with words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. (coughs) Or, in other words, we didn't wear a robe of 
of uh, just wanting money. You know, we didn't come to you trying to steal your money away. We didn't come talking this good talk and bringing all kinds of, of interesting things that, that wow and, and awe you. But we talked plainly. We, what you saw is what you got. We brought the word and only the word and truth. And God is witness, he says, nor of men sought we glory. We didn't, we didn't want to be glori glorified. We didn't want to be puffed up among anybody. It says, neither of you nor yet of others, when we, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Messiah. But it is interesting to note that when he exhorted people, when you exhort somebody, <laughs> it's typically to pick them up, to raise them higher, to get them to a higher level of understanding, to get them to a higher level of holiness. Be ye holy as I am holy, says Yehovah. So when you exhort somebody, sometimes it's like iron, ironing, sharpening iron. If you've ever seen a, a, a blade being sharpened, you get a stone. Typically you get a little, it's a sharpening stone. It's a really hard stone. And then you get your blade and you run it across. And what it does is it, it shears off some of the metal. It actually, you know, if there, if you, if you look at a dull blade, a dull knife, <coughs> you'll see that it has little ridges in it, and it's, and it's kind of. It looks like it has holes in it almost, at the at the edge. Instead of it being nice and round or nice and flat, it's kind of wonky. <laughs> so when you sharpen a knife, when you sharpen a piece of steel, a sword, uh, any of that kind of stuff, you'll you'll run it through this blade, and you'll constantly keep going over and what it does is it actually takes off metal it takes off more and more and more and more of the blade it actually it's breaking off pieces slowly but at the same time it's making it to where that blade is now beginning to get sharp or you can use that blade, and that blade is now useful. It's not. I mean, it's like uh, I have a I have a a knife that it looks pretty, <laughs> but if you were to get a board and you were to smack that thing really hard, it's not going to do. It probably wouldn't even dent it because it's not sharp. I mean, you could get a paper and poke through, try to poke through it, and it probably wouldn't even poke through a piece of paper because it's not sharp. It's just for pretty and we don't want to be that we want to be sharp we are supposed to carry around the sword of the spirit and the sword is useless if it's not sharp right his word is like a a, a, a sword that goes into the deepest parts of the bones and marrow as Hebrews tells us so it's sharp but if If we're not willing to be exhorted to where some pieces are not going to be shaved off from us and our imperfections are going to have to be scraped off, if we can't handle that, then we're not going to be truly exhorted and we're not going to truly get to the point to where we're going to be useful. So exhortation sometimes will be like correction, and it might hurt, even though it's for the good. And he says that he didn't come in deceit. He didn't come to try to 
to like I said wow or or he didn't come in some way to to change their minds craftily or or bring a message in a certain way so that that the people can they're like hmm that sounds kind of interesting but it doesn't quite sound right but you know what he made a good argument but it's like it's not exactly what it said though you know he, he kind of took some things out of context and 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 even though it says love for some reason he was saying that it, it means this other because the the letters and the the hebrew letters and the greek letters and and the numbers that go along with it and then all of a sudden it's just this grand thing and it's like wow so he didn't come in to seek he didn't do any of that nonsense. He just said, here's the word. You choose. It's up to you. We didn't we didn't come to deceive you guys. We came in truth. Because we know who we're pleasing. And we know who's going to try our hearts. If we come and, and try to manipulate anybody, then the Almighty is going to deal with us. So he understood that. And then he also said that he didn't come in <coughs> uncleanness. Well, what is uncleanness or guile? I mean, wait a minute here. Is uncleanness, did he, did he not come, with, did, he did, forgot to take a bath that day? Or well, what is it talking about? What is Paul talking about? He came, he didn't come in uncleanness. And then if we move on a little further farther in First Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll see, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Yeshua, that as you have received of us how we ought to walk and to please Yehovah, how we ought to walk and to please God. We beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Yeshua, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so that you would abound more and more. So see, the point is, Paul taught how to please God. He didn't teach how to please Christianity. He didn't teach how to please even Yeshua. He did not teach how to please himself, how to please the apostles, how to please the disciples, how to please the, 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 the leaders in the congregations. He didn't do that. He taught and he exhorted them how to walk out their faith so that they would please the Almighty just as Yeshua was pleasing to the Father. And the Father never left him. And we see Paul, that the Father never left him. Even though sometimes I think Paul had some, some kind of little issues every once in a while. <coughs> but he never left him. Because Paul was always trying to be pleasing unto the Almighty. What does that look like? Verse 2. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Yeshua. What commandments? <laughs> so Yeshua gave commandments. What commandments? Thou shalt love the Lord your God. Thou shalt love your neighbor. Well, those are two. For this is the will of God. Even your sanctification. Even your holiness. He, he's... He's saying this is the will of God. Your even the your holiness, how how holy you're supposed to be. This is that will of God for your lives. To the first to the Thessalonians, he says this that you should abstain from fornication. But he doesn't just stop there. Because most people will say, okay, see, 
the will of God is that you just stay away from fornication. Where did you get that from? And he says that every one of you should know, every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So every single one of the Thessalonians should have already known how to keep holy, how to keep this vessel holy and honorable. Not in the lust of con concupiscence <laughs> or passion, desire, craving, even as the Gentiles, which know not God. So in other words, he's saying, well, it's kind of funny because this word, the two words, lust and concupiscence, you could literally say for the passion of desires or passion of cravings. So even though we read lust, it's passion. That's why you can that that you can actually lust after spiritual gifts because you can have a passion for spiritual gifts. Paul said, that's fine. Do it. Have that passion towards them. Lust after that. But he says, don't lust. Don't have a passion for cravings, for just desires, for wrongful desires. Remember, the whole context is here. He begins with fornication and holiness. And verse 6, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, <clears throat> as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. So he hasn't called us to uncleanness. What is that? He therefore that despises, despiseth, despiseth not man but God, who also has given unto us his Holy Spirit. So even Paul says that God didn't call you to be unclean, but he called you to be holy, to be set apart. And he says the ones that don't do it, that despise the idea of being unclean, that despise that idea that, oh, you know what, I got to be clean. I've got to be holy. He says they don't despise anything else, any man, any person, but they despise the Almighty Himself. They hate the Father. They hate the Father. So that's one thing we need to understand, right? Is Because if we don't want to hate the Father. We, we want to love Him because we're told by Yeshua, you shall love the Lord your God. We shall love Yehovah, our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So to love him, we obviously have to worry about what is unclean. Wow. This is Paul writing after Yeshua resurrected. After the road to Damascus. After he was saved. But we're not to be unclean. Yeshua even pointed out in Matthew, Matthew 23, that the Pharisees were unclean. They were they were like tombs. They were the, the whitewashed sepulchers, full of dead men's bones and full of uncleanness. And then what's really interesting is in Romans. In Romans chapter 1, you see Paul, I encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 1. In Romans chapter 1, We could read this whole thing. 
start in verse 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, an idol, made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, whereof God also gave them up to uncleanness through their lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So if you think uncleanness is just a state of mind, he says to dishonor their own bodies. So uncleanness has to do with something physical. Hmm. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And then what's really interesting too is that in 2 Corinthians, at the end of 2 Corinthians, Paul tells them that they need to repent of their un cleanness and he's not talking about just <laughs> about like a mental unclean or thinking bad thoughts but he's talking about physical uncleanness because in chapter 6 he even says he tells them do not touch do not touch the unclean thing but he never explains what that is why because every one of you should know how to possess his vessel. But that's too far. Every one of you should know. This is the problem with me having to do like five things at once. <laughs> I didn't realize I was on a different slide. But every one of you should know. So Paul expected what he taught them. See, this is why we have a small portion of what Paul actually taught. Because we only got the letters. We don't got the fact that he was there with them for months and weeks and, and years sometimes. Teaching them and discipling them. No, we don't get any of that. We get a 15-minute letter. That you can literally, you can re literally read most of the New Testament letters in under 15 minutes. You can read most of them. So we get a 15 minute letter. And yet when Paul was there, he spent weeks with them. Day after day, Sabbath after Sabbath, teaching and exhorting and breaking down traditions and and, I mean, he was just laying out the word, showing Yeshua through the law and the prophets and the writings. So he expected when he wrote to them that they should already know. So they understood what uncleanness was. That's why he didn't have to write to them. He didn't have to explain it to them. That's why when he, when he told the Corinthians, touch not the unclean thing, they didn't have to ask him, or he didn't have to explain himself what the unclean thing was. But if the Pharisees were teaching things that were against the scripture, they had their religious ideas, they looked pretty, they had the outward appearance, they had their long flowing robes and their long seat seats and, and they just they just you know, even when they fasted and prayed that they did it out and they did it openly and they said, Oh, I'm thankful I'm not like the sinner, I'm not like the publican, but I am holy. <laughs> we saw the actions they had. Inside they were conniving. Inside, they were willing to murder. That's why he called them dead men's bones. You're, un, you're full of uncleanness. You're ugly. 
Yeah, you may look pretty outside. You may have all the right robe. You may talk the right talk. But no. My father's the one that, hey, he's, he's searching your heart and he's seeing some ugly things in there. So Paul tells them to be careful with the unclean thing. So how do we please Yehovah? God. How are we pleasing to Him? How do we show him we love him? How do we act? Because just as we read that in first in first John that we need to not love in word and tongue, but in deed and in truth. So how do we do it? Do we talk to the the leader in the denomination? Do we just think of something randomly and say, "Oh, that's how I Oh, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to go out and I'm going to give $500 to everybody I see. Or do we have a place to look? Because James tells us where we can look. James says, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of freedom, and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his work, in his deed. So he's going to be blessed in his doing, in what he does. And we know the only one that blesses and the only one that curses. And that's the Father. Yehovah blesses and he curses. And he, but he, James is very, very specific. This is the brother to Yeshua. This is the brother of Yeshua, the half brother of Yeshua, saying, We need to look into the perfect law of liberty. And then the apostle John, who put his head on the bosom of Yeshua, said this. Quoting Yeshua. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, and neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So if you love me, you're going to keep his commands. Command that he spoke. Love Yehovah. Thou shalt love Yehovah. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. And then he says in the very next chapter, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. And remember, love is an action word. Love is something that needs to be expressed. So the Father loved him, and he never left him. Left Yeshua. And what did Yeshua do to his disciples? He never left them. He taught them. He showed them. He explained to them. He asked. He answered their questions. He sent them out with power. So then he says in verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. So now most people want to stop right here. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Okay, let's keep the commandments, he said, and we get to be in his love. And that's it. But it says, even as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. 
So Yeshua is saying, I have kept my father's command. I mean, you cannot sugarcoat. You can't, no matter how you twist that, there is no way. Unless you believe like Marcion and the, the God of the New Testament and the God of the Old Testament are two different gods. That's the only way. That there's the father of the Old Testament and he's that he's the father God that gave them law and and blessed them but then cursed them because they were keeping that law and then the God of the New Testament comes and brings grace and truth and and brings gives gives Jesus down to the people with the King James Bible and he he says you can just get rid of that old law if you believe that way then you might be able to conjure up something but even then, it's still hard. <coughs> but he tells them, if you keep my commandments. So Yeshua kept his father's commandments. He was well-pleasing to the father. The father never left him, blessed him, gave him power, gave him authority. Because all authority under heaven is given to Yeshua. And he says, okay, now keep my commandments. You think his commandments would be different than, in the, than his father's? Probably not. Right? Because just like my son, if if I tell him something and he's what he, you know, he he does what I ask and then I I bless him and I help him and I do his, I, I'm there with him all the time. You think he's going to teach somebody else? something different he's going to say ah no you know what or get his brother and say no you know what you don't have to do it what dad said even though I'm blessed because I'm doing what he says I don't want you to uh, no you don't need to do that no more you get to do it your own thing you get to do I, I'll make some different ones for you it just doesn't make sense so what does the Almighty require. Do you mind if we take a moment and just a little bit longer? A little longer. <laughs> Deuteronomy 10. It says, And now, Israel, what doth Yehovah, your God, require of thee? But to fear Yehovah, reverence Yehovah, your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord your God, Yehovah, your God, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your soul to keep the commandments of Yehovah and his statutes which I command you this day for good. It's interesting because everybody wants to know what is the will of God for my life? What does God want me to do? What does he require of me? Well, hey, guess what? It's right there. Plain English. Easy to read. You don't even have to get a Strong's Dictionary out or uh, a Greek lexicon or a Hebrew, you know, any of that stuff. You can just read it and it's very plain and simple. It's, it's straightforward. What does he require? Fear Yehovah, to fear him, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve him. So, it seems like all four of those would, you know, go hand in hand, right? I mean, it, it may make sense. Let's continue on. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is Yehovah's, your God. The earth also, with all that there is. So everything is his. So it makes sense to, you know, hey, he's the creator. He's the one that made it all. We should follow his instructions. Only Yehovah had a delight in your father to love them. And he chose their seed after them, even you, ab you above all people, as it is this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. So there's a circumcision of the heart that the Almighty requires. But I thought that was a New Testament thing. 
Deuteronomy 5 says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them, nor ser <coughs> serve them, talking about idols. For I, Yehovah, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Let that sink in for a moment. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers, the sins of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. And Yeshua said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. I kept the father's commands. And he loved me. Thou shalt love Yehovah your God with all your heart. So we got to love him. But he says that those that hate him. He's going to have some issues with. And then in verse 10 it says, And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Four. <laughs> so Yeshua kept the commandments and he was pleasing to the Almighty was given authority, power. And he tells his disciples, do what I taught you. Follow my commandments. Abide in my love, just like I abided in, in my Father's love. And I kept his commandments. He was blessed. He wants his disciples to be blessed. He even said that he spoke nothing of himself, but only of what the Father told him. That's it. And the Almighty says in Deuteronomy to Moses, to the people, saying that I am going to have some issues with them that hate me, but those that love me, which is synonymous with, with keeping my commandments, he's going to show mercy to. Hmm. So he's probably requiring us to keep his commandments. You know, I don't know, save assumption, right? Deuteronomy 11. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day. What does that mean? To love the Lord your God. <laughs> Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Says Yeshua. And he says, if you shall hearken diligently unto, unto my commands, which I command you then that's the same thing as loving me. Why? Because love is an action. He spe you're, you're, li you're living what you say. You're walking out your words. You're not just saying, I love you, Lord. I love you, God. But you're demonstrating it by keeping his commands, his instructions. And it says to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Okay. That I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that th thou mayst gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, and I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayst eat and be full. So he's going to bless you with food. <laughs> so you're going to be provided for if you love him by keeping his commands. It's that simple. And I mean, 
it, it really is. It doesn't get a whole lot harder than that. And then verse 16 says, take heed to yourself. In other words, pay attention to what you're doing. That your heart be not deceived. Don't be deceived. See, the, you, you know, these kind of phrases, you hear them in the New Testament. Don't be deceived. Don't let the, the wolves come in and deceive you. Don't let false prophets deceive you. And, and we don't, we think that those are New Testament ideas, that it was a Christian idea. This comes back from all the way to Deuteronomy. It says, don't let your heart be deceived. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Don't go off and, and be doing other things that have nothing to do with what I said. And them, and then Yehovah's wrath be kindled against you. He's letting you know if you go and you deviate what he, from what he says, because when you don't love him, you hate him. When you hate him, you disregard his commands. You don't do what he says. When you don't do what he says, he says his wrath will be kindled against you. And he shut up the heaven and that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit and that you perish quickly from off the good land which Jehovah gives you. Wherefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as frontlets between your eyes and some and the Jewish people have have made that into wearing phylacteries, you know, the little thing on your head and and tying a bunch of rope around your arm and I mean that's not what it says. Cause all they have is the little piece in there. If they have the little forehead deal with the Shema in there, that's all it is, is like two verses. I think at the very most you have like 14 verses written in this little tiny piece of paper. But he says, therefore, you shall lay up these my words. Now, not just a couple of verses. He spoke a whole lot. This is Deuteronomy 11. So you have 10 chapters prior to this that he spoke. And that's not going to fit on this little tiny little square on the top of your head. But he says that we need to put these in our in our heart and in our being, our soul. You know, we've, we've gotten the whole idea of, of mind, soul, and spirit. And, be, you know, those, the, I mean, we dispelled that a while back. <coughs> but he says in your body, that's what that your soul is you, your living, breathing being. You got to you got to put these words, his words within your heart to where you love him and then your living, breathing being so that you're doing them because it's pointless to know and not do. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. But you shall know it. it and it's not just a, an under, or a, um, a knowledge of it. But that word knowing, to know the truth, is like a deep understanding of it to where you can live it out. Because if it's going to set you free, then that means that whatever you were doing, you were tied up and you couldn't move. And when you're free, you can move. Right? So when you know the truth, it can make you move. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your body, in your soul. Bind them for a, on as signs upon your hand, and that they may be frontlets between your eyes. Oh. And you shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in your house, and when they walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up that thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which Jehovah swore unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. And he didn't say put a mezuzah on your doorpost. He's, 
if you don't write them, you're going to write them. You write a whole bunch of them because he spoke a whole lot. Most people don't even put the Ten Commandments, but they'll put Shema Israel, or even just the word Shema. And there you go, there's, that's all you need. But that's not what he said. He's talking about teachings. Every moment of the day, all day long, as you're moving, you're living his word. You're teaching his word. For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love Yehovah your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, to get a hold of him. <laughs> if you'll do that, then will Yehovah drive out all the nations, these nations from before you, and you shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves, Every place whereon the sole of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness and Lebanon, from the river, the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. So he's letting the, the children of Israel know at this point in time, when they go out there, if they were to keep the commands, and that's why when Joshua showed up, it was beautiful, because he kept the commands, and what did he do? He went through there, and it was his. It was theirs for the taking. Every single time. So every. Every person. And I, you know. It's amazing when you read this. And then he says that he's going to drive out nations. And all these things. And yet we see most. We see Israel today. Nations are not being driven away. But nations are coming over. And trying to attack. Israel. They're trying to take over land. And Israel is giving away land. They're not taking land. They're giving away land. That father said, here, this is yours. And they're giving it away. I mean, come on. Anyway. So you're going to take nations. And says, verse 25 there shall be no man be able to stand before you for Yehovah your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon the land that you shall tread upon as he has said unto you behold I set before you this day a blessing and a curse you either love or you hate simple as that a blessing if you obey the commandments of Yehovah your God, which I command you this day. When you obey the commandments, just as we read a few verses earlier in Deuteronomy 11, it says that if you keep the commands, you're loving him, you're going you're gonna to just cleave unto him, you're going to grab a hold of him, and you're going to love him with all of your heart, and your soul, your mind, and your strength. But he says, a curse is also here, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of Yehovah your God. So you'll be cursed. If you Remember, we just finished reading that. If you hate him, he says he's going to visit the sins, the iniquities of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. If you hate him. If you don't obey his commands. figures if you will not obey the commandments of Yahweh your God but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you have not known other gods other mighty ones This is why John could write in 1 John 5. By this we know that we love the children of God 
when we love God and keep his commandments. We know that we love our brothers when we keep the commands of the Almighty. Why? We're going we're gonna to see. Not today. But basically, because the Almighty says, this is how you treat your brother. My commandment is, this is how you treat your brother. This is how you treat your neighbor. This is how you treat your servant, the one working for you, your slave. Same thing. Your employee. This is how you treat your children. This is how you treat your wife. This is how you treat your husband. These are my commands. I'm commanding you to do it this way. So we know that we love each other. We love our brothers. We love our sisters. We love our children, our wives, our husbands. Our, you know, I can go into the whole homosexual thing. But we know that we love the body of Messiah when we keep his commandments. He says, for this is the love of God. Yeshua said, Thou shalt love Yehovah, the Lord your God, with all your heart. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and all the prophets hang on these two great commands. Why? Because if we love God, we're going to, and we keep his commandments, we're going to love the children of God. And John tells us this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not hard. They're not grievous. So loving the Almighty, when thou shalt love, is commanded by Yeshua. We know now that we need to love the Almighty by keeping his commandments. Simple enough. I know this is probably a refresher for most, if not everybody. Hopefully everybody. But this is the beginning of some teachings we're going to be bringing forth. Um, that's going to show us how to love the Almighty. How do we stay away from uncleanness? What is that unclean thing that he says don't touch? That Paul tells us. Paul told the Corinthians, don't touch the unclean thing. That he told them that, you know what, they need to repent because of they had some unclean things. They were or they were because they were unclean. So we're gonna learn what that is. We're going to learn what it is to, to truly love the Almighty. So we're going to walk through the commandments. So we're going to, you know, it's not going to be a, a like Torah portion style where we're going to do, you know, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 kind of idea. Uh, but we're going to, we're going to, Begin. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I can give you homework right now. We're gonna begin in Exodus 20 with the the famous Ten Commandments. <laughs> so we're gonna deal with the Ten Commandments because just like the children of Israel, he said, "Get ready." Prepare yourself, because in three days, I'm going to come and I'm going to meet with you. So we get a little more of an opportunity. We got a whole week ahead of us. And we're going to hear what the Almighty said to the children of Israel, just like they heard. Because we get a written, we, we've got a, a written account of what he said to the children of Israel, 
And so we're going to look at each one of those. And the difference is, well, let me put it this way. I hope the difference will be that most everybody listening will not do like the children of Israel and say, oh, okay, after the 10, that's enough. I don't need to know anymore. You you know what? You you go talk to him. You go. <laughs> and, and we'll just list, we'll, we'll listen to you. But we don't want to hear him because he's too, his words are a little too hard. He, he's got too much power. <laughs> I hope you're not that way. I pray that you receive his word and that you want more of him to hear his voice. Because remember, Yeshua says it very, very clearly that he, that God is spirit. And he expects those to worship him in spirit and in truth. So if God is spirit, then the commandments were given by the Holy Spirit. So if they're given by the Holy Spirit, then to understand the, the, the commands, we need to have the Holy Spirit. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, then we're going to have to rely on ourselves and on even on somebody else. So if we, I encourage you to pray this week. If you don't already have the Spirit, I pray that, or I, I, I will encourage you to ask the Father for the Holy Spirit. Because that's all we have to do. We don't have to have some crazy service. We don't have to, I don't have to play all kinds of music and get all, oh, come on and sing upon him and he's going to come and we're going to, oh, say Jesus, 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 Jesus. Because that's, you know, that's one of the ways that one guy wanted to grab me. He grabbed me by the head and, and then grabbed my arm and he started shaking me and he was saying, you just scream it out loud, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And after a while, I was just like, okay, whatever. And I just started saying all kinds of weird stuff and he thought I had the Holy Spirit and I just wanted him away from me. It doesn't take that. It takes you asking. Talking with the Almighty and asking Him to give you the Holy Spirit. That's all it is. I mean, I it's not hard. You know, Yeshua said, I'll pray Him. I'll pray the Father to give you the Holy Spirit. All we have to do is ask. We have the Holy Spirit, we'll understand what the Spirit gave to His people to bless them. Because He says, I bring to you a blessing and a curse. Everybody, most, peop most people I know anyways, want to be blessed. Mm, there's a couple that seem to always want to be cursed and they always curse everything they do and everything like that. But most people want to be blessed. Even the ones that or seem to be down and out all the time and curse everything and and want their lives to go terrible and all this stuff and they just wish death and all kinds of things on their lives, even them still want blessing. They still want to be blessed. And the Almighty says, I bring before you a blessing and a curse. Blessing if you keep my commands, a curse, a curse if you disobey them. If you choose you don't want them, you can have the curse. If you choose you want them, then you have the blessing. So we need to understand what the commands are so that we can be blessed. And First John tells us that they're not hard. You know, if you go through Judaism, if you read through the Talmud, if you go through all that stuff, well, yeah, the commands are hard. They're ridiculously hard. But when you just read them, thou shalt not kill. I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Thou shalt keep the Sabbath holy. Okay. <laughs> There's not a whole lot. It is not complicated. So, we're, But we're going to look at those, uh, like I said, in the upcoming weeks. 
um, and and I'm not sure how long it'll take. I I thought about putting a time frame to it, but I figured that's probably a bad idea. You know, there's not 613 commands. We'll get into that, but so we're not going to go through 613 individual commands and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, but we will be looking at the commands and how to please the Almighty. So before we move any further and before we dismiss completely, I want to bless you in the name. So, Father, we come before your presence and we just thank you and glorify you for your word and for understanding, Father, what it is to love you. Father, show us, guide us. Father, I know I, I, I brought forth some questions that I didn't answer for you people. I know I may have challenged ideas but it's because Father I want you to speak to them I want them to search you out Father I want them to seek your word to search the scriptures So, Father, I ask that you use me to help provoke your people to good works, to exhort your people, to guide them and lead them to you. Not to follow me, but to follow you, Father, so that they can get hold of you. Just as John says, that I must decrease so that you may increase. Father, I am only a servant asking that you use me for your people. And I ask, Father, that you bless your people abundantly, that you show them and guide them in each and every moment and every day that they're, they're going through their lives and in whatever it is, Father. And simply from waking up, going to bed, and all the things in between. Father, watch over them. Protect them from the evil one that wants to come and steal your word from them. Father, I ask that you put in us that heart of flesh so that we won't have that stony heart and reject your word. Let us not be stiff-necked, hard-hearted, but instead let us circumcise our hearts to receive your word, to receive your blessings, and to follow your will. Father, we know that your will is easy to find out. It's the details that we need to seek you even more for. It's the details on how we live moment to moment. Which way we should go left or right or into this city or that city. or Should we shop at this place or that place, Father? It's those details we need to hear your voice for. Ask that you open the ears and the minds of your people so that they can hear your word, Father. And open my ears and my mind so that I can hear you clearer. Help us to walk out this path, this faith that was once delivered to the saints. <laughs> Isa Yehova Panaveleha, Be'asem Lecha, Shalom. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Yeshua's name, amen, amen. So, 
I pray this has been a blessing to you guys. Uh, I know it was kind of lengthy, but uh, <laughs> if uh, so, so if you have any questions, comments, um, prayer requests, I know Sister Wanda, you had a prayer request before we do anything else. Um, yeah, so that way we can do that. So Wanda, if you want to bring that up, so that way you told me not to, not to let you forget. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm still having problem with this lump in my mouth, and um, I was thinking, I was telling sister, um sometime this week I guess it was that I I was going to ask my sister for a medical release term so she can help me schedule a, a dentist appointment and then I was telling her about about certain things and and then um, I talked to my sister about it but my sister said do this, do that, and do the other three things. And um, I said, okay. And I, I didn't feel right about it. And so um, I didn't tell her. I, I, I already found a dentist ap appointment to go to, to go check my, out my mouth. And, um, so, um, so I don't have to tell my sister a about it, about getting me a medical release form, because Jehovah's worked it out for me. Amen. So that's, that's a praise report right there. And then, um, I hope you guys understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So, um, on Tuesday of this week, I have a doctor's appointment three hours away from here to go check to see what's going on with my mouth. I have a, that lump is like a like a quarter size. It's like a quarter size um, lump in my mouth. So, and then pr Father provided me a ride over there and, r and a ride back mm -hmm. because I was kept wondering how am I going to get over there. Cause I don't ha I don't drive I don't um I don't have driver license and stuff, and um one of my friends said that she'll take me over there and back. Okay, amen. So that's that's another place report too. So but keep me in prayer to see what the dinner says about about this lump, and so it won't get so it won't pop open before the for a dentist appointment. That's my prayer request too. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray real quick then before we um, do anything else. Then. Amen. So, Father, we come before you and we thank you for healing on Sister Wanda. Father, we declare healing and wholeness and, and perfect health in Sister Wanda. Father, you know her desire is to please you. You know her heart. Father, I ask and I expect, Father, because your word is true. You said that your word is never going to come back to you void, Father. And, and, and you said that you are the healer. So, Father, I declare that lump in her mouth gone. I declare that it is nothing, that it is, it, it is removed from her body. That, Father, even when the doctor gets to see it, that it is, they're going to tell her that it's nothing. Or they, when she gets there, it might even be that it's gone. Father, we believe you. And I rebuke any doubt. I rebuke any, any kind of hindrance to your word, your spirit going forth, Father. But we, we ask in Yeshua's name. And we praise you.
Father, remove that thing that's wanting to come into our life and, and bring pain, bring fear. We rebuke the enemy in Yeshua's name. I rebuke him. I rebuke sickness. I rebuke the disease. Anything, Father, that, that is inside the, a virus, whatever it is, Father, it needs to come out now. And I declare wholeness. Father, make her the way you desire her. The way you created her to be. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So is there any comments, questions, or any other prayer questions you need to ask? No. Um, Pastor Marcus had just talked about the um, sound, but uh, he said it was slightly better at, at the end. Okay, good. And so, um, but me, I, I do. I have a comment. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Um, I love the fact that you're going to take us through these Ten Commandments, you know, um, expounding on them, showing us how to have this love that we say that we have for the Father. You know, um, it's one thing to say and it's another thing to show. I think it. I think this is much needed. A lot of people. Um, I put myself included uh, because I was there once. Um, and I still, as of today, still need um, stuff to be retaught and to educate myself continuing. It's, it's never ending. So, But I, I was there. So um, a lot of people uh, that don't read and they just go off by the assumption that you just need to believe and that's it you know I, I believe in the creator I hear people say or I I uh, believe in God and and uh, and he knows my heart he knows your heart yes and he constantly reminds us how wicked that heart <laughs> is you know Amen. it's but they won't know that until they read that you know, so they think their heart is clean. They think their heart is pure. They think just by randomly smiling at someone, they did a good deed. You know, just by um, lending out maybe a $20 bill to someone in need, they, they did a good deed. And it's not to say that's not counted for. It, it is. Don't get any of that wrong. It is counted for, even in Revelation, how, uh, um, how y even Yeshua, he was talking to the, um, to the the congregations at that time, or when he was giving the vision out. You know, he he counted their their. Uh, good deeds every single one of them of course except for Laodicea didn't have didn't have anything good to say on that one so I pray and pray and pray for those that uh, are you know have nothing to do with the father at all um, and, and despise him at will uh, th they uh, I pray for you you know Laodicea didn't have nothing uh, good to be said but anyways back to the the congregations that Yeshua d did show that he did he counted good things towards those congregations look I see you're doing this you're doing this you're doing that great it's all counted to you but you know that's where that's where the people don't see his butts that's where a lot of people don't get it and comprehend the fact that he does have limits he has limitations to a grace the grace period that people love to throw out you know so i do love the fact that you're going to take us through these steps and i do hope and and pray those that are are coming new to the torah that they'll they'll uh, have their eyes you know opened wide and and um, 
are, you know, will receive of Yehovah and, and see how it is to love him. It's just like anybody that whether you're married, whether you're dating, or even whether you're single and you're hoping to find a spouse or a, a co- you know, uh, someone for for life, you you start looking at relationships. That's how I look at how I look at Father when it when it comes to His Word and how to love Him. You know, when you're first wanting to find someone, you start looking for. Uh, what interests that person when you start courting someone or you're starting to date them you know you start asking them um their likes and their dislikes and um you know and you're sh- even as you're married you know you s- you still don't know your spouse I- i'm you know me and my husband are already up there in a couple of years we have on our on our little belt here but I still, he, you know, you still surprise me when something you didn't like and it's like, oh, I didn't, I forgot or I didn't know at all, (laughs) you know. So with Father, it's, it's a continual love that, you know, that continual love of always giving room to know him. I mean, you can have so many years, uh, you know, you can have so many so many years under you and say, "Oh well, I know him and and uh, I don't need to be taught anymore, you know, and then you're not you're not giving him room, you're putting him on a box he he can still show you mm-hmm. you know we we can never get to that point where we're not unteachable, you know that's why I'm always trying to encourage people stay hungry." always stay hungry i mean trust me you're gonna still be hungry up until close to your passing away everybody still needs to eat so look at at if it's not it like if you're not even looking towards a relationship to try to look at that as an example then look at it as that you're all you're hungry physically you know everybody's hungry physically and without substance you know you're that's it. I mean, what else is there to say on that one? So, I mean, stay hungry, everybody. That's So, I'm really happy that you're going to walk us through this. Yeah. I have one more thing to say. Um, people, I guess, um, I don't know how many people, but there's people who think that um, killing is like murder, like, Killing, killing people with, with a gun or stabbing with someone and everything, but killing um, could be watching. You have to watch what you say sometimes. That's what um, you have to watch what you say sometimes, and that's part of it. Probably is probably the word killing too is all about too is watch what you say. Oh, de- definitely. I mean, uh, you can. You can cause a lot of hurt with just your words, so because our words have power, you know, there's death and life, or in the power of the tongue. Um, amen. So, well, if that's if that's all we have, is there anything anything else? All right. Well, in that case, then uh, again, thank you for being here with us, and uh, thank want to thank you guys for for being with us online as well uh, we really appreciate every single one of you uh, like I said we're n- I'm not doing this to to help me you know even though I am <coughs> but I see the need in a lot of the the people I talk to and uh, even even sometimes even here in our home I've seen where we need to understand the commands of the Almighty. We need to know how to really love Him and to show that we love Him because if we love Him and we keep His commands, it's just like like the Bible tells us that we're, we're going to end up loving each other. 
because of it. So we're gonna we're gonna show that we love each other by keeping his commands and that's you know, and so many people are just talking about that as oh we just need to love and we need to love and we need all this stuff, but not realizing what true love really is. You know, not realizing how if we were to do it the way the Bible tells us to do, the way the the Almighty tells us to do, then we wouldn't have a whole lot of these conversations. We wouldn't have a lot of these crazy left wing, right wing, and your Democratic Republican or you're this and that and black and white and I mean you wouldn't have these kind of conversations because we would be doing it the way Father said to do it. We would be living by his standard. And his standard is a whole lot better than any, any, any of our standards. So uh unless our standard is his standard. But um amen. So again thank you for, for being with us and um ask that you just do a little reading Exodus 20 start on the I, I encourage you to check out that because we're going to be dealing with that next week um, in the beginning with the commands how to how to really love him so amen so until next Saturday one o'clock next Shabbat we'll be getting together one o'clock uh, Shabbat Shalom amen Shabbat. Shabbat.